Remember when we read before that Esther Junkie Phillips was like, you girls can't perform with me. And I'm around here with uh, pearls and jewelries and fragrances and uh, furs and things. And y'all around here looking like ragamuffins. <laughs> Bugs. Hello there, Bellas. If you have not already done so, please remember to like, share the Facebook, subscribe, and visit uptopbeauty.com. And if you are not already a part of this book club, please hit the Patreon link below and or the join button here on the YouTube and for a small monthly fee of $5, you babies, yes, you can be privy to all the shenanigans before the YouTube gets it, if the YouTube gets now, it. Now, let's continue talking about Miss Ruth. Still so excited. Her life as a pointer sister. You've heard that old cliche about how getting to the top in showbiz is actually much easier than the precipitous fall from the mountaintop. It happens to be true. In the case of the fabulous pointer sisters, it took only about six months for us to reach the summit. The man who took us there was our fearless manager, David Rubinson. David stressed first and foremost longevity in the business. It would have been the easy move to push four black women from the ghetto into a rhythm and blues and funk soul slot, but David instinctively sensed there was more to us. Without a doubt, David was totally responsible for making the Pointer Sisters who we were. He was our savior, our flag bearer, and our protector. He pumped about $100,000 of his own money into the act and even bought my parents their first color television set. That sort of generosity went a long way with us. We plain loved the man, but that doesn't mean that every now and then we didn't feel like slapping the taste out of his mouth. Like most producers, David possessed a Spengali type of personality and practically defined the term control freak. He had a hair trigger temper, a sharp tongue, and a brutal manner. And sometimes when things didn't go to his liking, he would rearrange the furniture in his office by picking it up and throwing it. He was under a lot of pressure, and I'm sure our casual attitude and bohemian lifestyle didn't sit well with him. You know why? Because that's his money. That's what she said. I understand that you, you know, stressed out because you didn't invest it $100,000 into us and we been around here. You know, you feel like we're not taking this serious because it's not our money. That's how young people are. I wish I had that early. Taking life serious. Y'all, I didn't really take life serious till I got in my 30s. He put us on a $50 a week allowance, made us take tap dance lessons, and was constantly on our cases to rehearse, which consisted of endlessly singing our songs as we sat around the pool table in David's office, accompanied by a piano player, Norman Landsberg. I remember singing Yes We Can, Cloudburst, and wang dang doodle until we were blue in the face. More often than not, by the time those endless sessions finally concluded, we'd be swigging from a liquor bottle and passing around a reefer to break up the monotony. David did not join in. He was what I would call a clean hippie. No drugs, no excess, no bullshit or business. What the hell do you think is going on, he'd scream, when he felt we weren't serious enough. This ain't no game. We got to get down to business and do it right or not at all. I wasn't much of a fan of his yelling at us like we were children, but I can't say I blame him for getting upset. It was his wallet on the table. He fronted the money for our first recording session to the tune of about 35000 and he needed us to deliver the goods to Blue Thumb. Get hot or go home was a frequent phrase used in the music industry. And more often than not, 
You get only one shot at it, if you're lucky. David knew we all needed to be in tip-top form, vocally, mentally, and physically. Yeah, because you fucking around with his money. Now, what I do see and respect of David Rubinson is that unlike the other books we read that were associated with Motown, I don't sense anything of a pimp hole dynamic in this. Nothing. I, okay. I would hate to think that that's just synonymous to black producers. Now, if I'm wrong, you can tell me. But I don't sense him saying, look, I didn't invest in this money. You pointer sisters, which would make a good uh, bag out there on the street. You pointer sisters need to get out there and, and sell some a stanker and get me my bag back. I don't feel that at all. I didn't feel that in Anita's book, and I don't feel it in Ruth's book. But, you know, let's wait and see. Anything's bound to happen. Above the only thing David didn't try to control was how we dressed, which was just as well because we were so broke, we picked up most of our wardrobe at secondhand shops and thrift stores. David actually loved our look and encouraged us to wear our vintage 1940s threads on the up and coming album. Now, what Ruth did say was that luckily the photographer knew how to um, photograph the girls in a way that the clothes didn't look so old. You know what I'm saying? That they looked fresh because sometimes it's all about a filter, honey. But the fact that they had that good photographer made the album cover look outstanding, okay? And they look good in it, shit. Who knew that it was a burn hole in one of their hats? The girls and I pooled our money to rent a condominium in an Oakland suburb close to a prison facility. Our transportation to and from San Francisco was a red Audi, but it should have been a bright yellow because that sucker was a lemon. It never ran smoothly and stopped and started whenever it felt like it. It shook and rattled and rolled through the Bay Area. And our trips became even more tough and go after Anita and I, the only licensed driver, took the wheel. We both started wearing contact lenses at the same time and couldn't see worth a damn until we adjusted the lenses because you know how the lenses um, now are soft and it's like you can't really feel them. Child, when I got my first pair of contact lenses in the 90s, them must was hard, okay? They was hard. It was like... But you know what? Those were damn good times for the Pointer Sisters. No matter what happened, we were all together in it together. And we lived and sang as one. Everything that happened, good and bad, brought us closer and made us stronger. Vocally, I knew my place. I might have been the oldest sister, but I was the newest member of the group. It wasn't lost on me that I hadn't paid a fraction of the dues my siblings had in years before I joined. The last thing I wanted was for it to look and sound like I had come aboard to commandeer the ship. More than once in those early days, I opted out of an opportunity to sing lead and defer to one of my vocally talented and charismatic sisters. I felt my time would come if I hung in there long enough. The others had been doing it for a long time and deserved to be up front. I was just happy to have a seat at the table and a spot at the microphone. To their credit, the executives at Blue Thumb did not repeat the mistake Atlantic made of trying to model the Pointer Sisters after other contemporary acts like Honeycomb or the Jackson Five. David was involved in every aspect of our debut album. He had been a gifted engineer before he became a producer and meticulously planned it to the utmost detail. He booked us to record at Pacific Radio Studio in San Francisco in the autumn of 1972. One of the first songs we cut was the basic track from the Alan Toussaint pinned. Yes, we can. A socially conscious song was a musical vow to make the world a better place and had been originally recorded in 1970 as Yes We Can by Lee Dorsey. 
I knew the song was good, but had no idea it would turn out to be our first big hit in the summer of 1973. I said it when I read Anita Pointer book, and I'ma say it again when I'm reading Ruth book. Obama, why you do them ladies like that? Because you know his uh, slogan was, yes, we can, okay? We had a super duper hit with yes, we can. You don't think to call the Pointer Sisters to sing the damn song? Brother? Nita was disappointed, and so was Ruth. How you not gonna call the Pointer Sisters? I mean, they, they gaffled. Yes, we can. They murked that joint. Come on, Obama. For reasons still murky to me, after we cut that first track, David switched recording locales to Wally Hyder Studio at 245 High Street between Turk and Eddie Streets. The building had been occupied by 20th Century Fox for film offices, screening rooms, and storage until Ida transformed it in 1969 into one of the hippest recording studios in the country. I don't know if it was the new studio, the vibes, or frankly, the weed, but those were some of the most magical days of our lives. The songs, the arrangements, the trademark harmonies, the complex vocals, and interactions with the musicians on the session. It all seemed to come together and naturally fall into place. My low register laid the foundation. Bonnie added the brassy tone. Anita taking the alto soprano role and June the soprano falsetto. Together, our wide range and nicely stacked Harmony blended naturally. Many times we only needed to rehearse a song for about an hour before we put it on tape and often achieved a master vocal in just three or four takes. But some of the songs like Cloudburst were difficult, requiring hours of study in order to be done in four part harmony and always with the understanding that it would have to be duplicated live. Ooh. Uh, excuse me, bitches. Now, you better get it right in this studio. Okay? All right. Okay. Take one. Take two. Take three. Know that you're going to have to do this 100,000 other times when you on the stage. So, once you get it, you better keep it. We were seeing a variety of highly complex material that was polished to near perfection. Mixing R&B, Wang Dang Doodle, with Bebop, Cloudburst. Boogie Blues, Jada, and Mid-Tempo, Light Rock, River Boulevard to form an eclectic, energetic, and joyous style that would come to define our sound. No tricks, just carefully arranged, excitingly performed, damned good music. With the Pointer Sisters album in the can and set for a May 1973 release, it was time to pay some attention to how we looked. On our tight budget, designer costumes were not an option. Remember when we read before that Esther Junkie Phillips was like, you girls can't perform with me and I'm around here with uh, pearls and jewelries and fragrances and uh, furs and things and y'all around here looking like ragamuffins. We had always shopped at secondhand stores, not only because it was cheap, but also because all of us had that sort of old jitterbug, Chicago nightclub spirit running through our veins and enjoy dressing that way as well. We bought vintage gowns, waist cinching jackets, wigs, teardrop wool hats, boa feathers, cocktail jewels, high heels, and chic hankies, which was and still in our trademark. We camped it up big time and were more than a little surprised when our style soon set the trend. It was not a reflection on our look that we made our first public appearance at a swanky San Francisco landmark called Bimbo's on Clubhouse Avenue. They at this place singing their songs, but in the back, they ain't even think nothing about uh, getting the band together. The band in the back looking like Parliament. Oh, shit. We didn't think about that. Maybe we should have talked to them first, okay? At that same event, Ruth blew her voice out. Where the fuck is my voice? It was okay, because 10 days later, something even bigger and better than that event, because that event tanked, wasn't good. 
they didn't know how to get things ready. I mean, if they had a manager, the manager should have been able to be like, we gotta get the sound together. Roof, you need to be over here sucking on sucrets. But it didn't go well, right? But the next event, they blew roof off the house. 10 days later, I needed my voice at its best because that's when the Pointer Sisters got the biggest break of our career. Singing as a fill-in at the famous Troubadour in Los Angeles on May 15th. Like old Colonel Sanders used to say, we were flat out finger licking good, child. Fit Colonel Sanders, you know, that's the Kentucky Fried Chicken Man. Our own special recipe of hot scat, rock, jazz, and bebop had the packed house jumping and hollering for a solid hour and demanding multiple encores. I'd go so far as to say that LA had never seen or heard anything quite like us before. Diana Ross and Helen Reddy were in the house that night with their husbands. Bob Ellis Silverstein, that would be Tracy Ellis Pappy, and entertainment manager Jeff Wald. They came backstage to tell us how blown away they were by our performances. And Wald promptly booked us for four performances on Helen's Network TV Summer Replacement Variety Show. A critic gave us a fantastic review in the next issue of Newsweek Magazine. And we were truly off to the races. Yeah. 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 